Right, uh, morning everyone, and uh, I'm Martin Gustafsson, I know some of you, um, and I'm going to be talking about the use and abuse of indicators. I want to, I want to look a little bit at the history of indicator-based planning. I'm originally a history teacher, so um, maybe that's one. But I think it also helps us to understand a little bit why we are where we are. Um, then a few concrete examples from the public and private sectors and some discussion of this. I mean, I'm assuming that you are, you already have a lot of experience when it comes to indicators. You have fairly strong opinions about them um, and you want to refine those understandings and, and, and skills. Um, so on the basis of that, we're going to then discuss uh, um, some examples. I'm, I'm, I'm using two public sector examples and one private sector example. Um, and then this, this session is going to spill over into tomorrow. Um, so probably tomorrow we will be looking at um, uh, the polemics or the debates around when and how to use indicators. There is some literature on this, not enough. Um, there is, this is not something that's, that's straightforward and, 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 and clear. There, there, there's a lot of controversy around indicators. Uh, we then have a case study where we look at our South African teacher development indicators. We'll be looking at the national APP and one provincial APP. And then finally some pointers for best practices in the South African public sector. Uh, which then sums up what, what I believe are, are, are some of the ways we should be moving in. Um, but um, my, my, some of my, my opinions may be, may be modified by, by my interaction with you. Now, so we won't spend much time defining what an indicator is. I'm assuming you've been through that kind of training. Um, for our purposes, it's, it's a time series of numbers, generally annual, that helps planning and reporting. I'm also not going to look at classifications of indicators. You've probably been to training where you get told this is an input indicator, process indicator, output, outcome, what's the difference between output and outcome. I'm not going to be looking at that because I'm assuming that you've got, you've already had exposure to that. Um, my own opinion is that a lot of training around indicators focuses on that, but then not very much else. Uh, and I think that's a pity. <coughs> But what I do uh, in this, in this uh, session is, 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 is touch on a few different types of indicators. In particular, uh, what I try to acknowledge is that one has very high level sectoral type uh, indicators, number of grade 12 passes in mathematics, for instance, and one has more fine-grained organizational indicators to do with the number of legal cases resolved by the Department of Basic Education in a year, those kinds of more operational uh, indicators. Now, I will, I will focus on the whole kind of chain of, 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 of indicator production, which of course involves selecting indicators. Sorry, this is... No. Selecting indicators, calculating indicators, documenting uh, indicators, presenting them to your readers, your users, and then just understanding just the general use in governance of uh, indicators. I've tried to make use of, of uh, the literature that's available, um, but I find the literature a little bit thin, because partly because a lot of the literature on indicators I find very uh, theoretical, non-empirical. It's, it's, it's preaching a particular you know, philosophy and framework, but what I often find missing in the literature on indicators is, so how are those things actually used? Um, now, it would be very difficult to examine empirically through research the impact of having indicators on, say, school attendance. Right? That would be a very difficult uh, causal link to draw. But what one can do is to at least uh, get feedback from both producers, users of indicators to get a sense of whether 
these indicators make sense, whether they, they are useful for planning, and there's very little on that in the literature. The literature is very much about, the, here's a model, use it, um, but very little on, 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 on the, how, how these models are received. Um, and we, we're going to try and be honest about indicators, um, in particular about whether the investment we make in this area really makes a difference to the effectiveness of our organizations and service delivery on the ground, so feel free to air your frustrations. Um, and I hope you have frustrations. Um, okay, something on, on, on history. Now, what, what, I, what I did do, because we were supposed to be uh, technologically innovative, I've, I've, I, I tried out uh, a PowerPoint's uh, recording uh, uh, facility. Um, now, it's not terribly relevant on, 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 on these two slides, but it will be more relevant at a later slide where I, where I sum up some of the uh, positions that, that I think we should be taking. But let's just try it out here. Um, see if it works. A bit of history on indicators can be interesting and can help explain why certain things are the way they are today. Statistics have, of course, been around for a long time, but for long, statistics were really the preserve of a ruling class. It's only more recently that statistics have become something that citizens in general are concerned with uh, in order to hold governments accountable. The word statistics, in fact, is related to the word state. It's information for the state. Ancient civilizations, uh, when developing their information systems, focused above all on systems that would tell the government how much tax or other resources to expect from the population. So population censuses were important. Uh, the earliest population census probably those of ancient Egypt, and here some historians have argued that the census was used to determine how large pyramids could be. Uh, the larger the population, the more labor that could be extracted from the population, and hence the larger the pyramids. A modern tradition of national statistical offices, such as our Statis A, can be traced back to the establishment in the early 1800s of the French National Office, which in turn owes much to the influence of Napoleon, whose influence in the design of the modern state is, of course, very large. On the side of the private sector, um, the management analyst Frederick Taylor and the industrialist uh, Henry Ford, after whom the car is named, um, popularized te management techniques known as Taylorism and Fordism in industrial processes. Uh, this involved measuring the productivity through productivity indicators of individual workers and also groups of workers and then firing and adjusting pay uh, accordingly. These management approaches were widely embraced across the world, in fact, even in non capitalist countries such as the Soviet Union. All right, that's as far as it's recorded. Partly because the, the recordings make your files enormous. Um, right, so, so government statistics have been around for a very long time, but, but performance indicators are really something that uh, have been around for four or five generations and have their origins in the private sector, in, 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 in new large industries, car manufacturing plants, uh, this is really where a lot of the thinking uh, comes from. Uh, it was really only after the Great Depression and the Second World War that um, one started to see massive collection of, of, of economic and social data um, by governments. And, of course, one key uh, uh, early tool for, for, for uh, indicators and accountability were the national accounts. Um, these things that StatsSA produces that tells us what GDP is, um, imports, exports, and so on. Um, and a lot of the methods uh, 
around that, that we see applied in education actually come from from those tools and many of the arguments have yeah many of the arguments some of the controversy around the use of indicators is that, that the approaches that we apply in education to non-financial indicators are often better suited for financial indicators. To a large extent, it's uh, methods from financial accounting that have been adopted to look at performance uh, and, 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 and sectoral uh, progress on the social side. Uh, in South Africa, uh, Stats SA goes back as far as 1910. It had various different names. Under apartheid, uh, it was split up. Uh, there were different Bantustan uh, statistical agencies which created problems around uh, even, even today, uh, understanding some of the, the, the statistical history of South Africa. But then post-94, um, these things came together, and, and now we have Stats SA. Um, in 1968, um, this, the national account system was standardized uh, in something now called the system of uh, national accounts. And there are, um, there are even education elements in that system. Uh, these rules are maintained by the IMF and when Treasury tells us, for instance, we must split our budget between primary and secondary schooling, that's actually coming from the IMF and from these rules because they need to do international comparisons and we need those international comparisons. Um, so many of the instructions that we get around our reporting systems originate from this, this uh, international uh, system. Then, on the more management uh, side, um, new public management um, was an approach that was introduced in rich countries uh, in the 1980s to try and make governments more efficient. Governments were taking on a larger role. Uh, well, the welfare state was growing in the UK was a national health system and so on and there was a need for governments not to be drowned by all of these responsibilities and one of the responses was to introduce this philosophy called new public management and the idea was to make government a little bit more like a private sector so when prior to this government had been very rigid very rule based you didn't do anything unless there was a rule to it um, but that was just not sustainable. So there was a loosening up, uh, less of, of a dependence on fixed rules, more a dependence on, on, on the initiative of individuals. But then how do you control those individuals in this environment? Well, one of the tools was indicators. So you give people certain freedoms, but then you say, look, at the end of the day, you need to produce this. And this is how we're going to measure your performance. Um, now, I mean, there are debates around whether new public management is, is dead or still alive. And they, they, if you look at the literature, people will say, no, it's actually been eclipsed by other uh, forms of thinking. Uh, uh, the presence of, of computers and the internet has changed the nature of government. Not so much in South Africa yet, but certainly uh, in rich countries, and it's something that we will see coming, and it's going to change the way we behave, the way we plan. Um, but certainly new public management is still, the ideas are still very dominant, uh, very much present in, in, in public uh, sector uh, thinking. Now in developing countries, uh, new public management was often influenced by what is known as the logical framework approach. And the logical framework approach, you may not have heard this term, but you're very, very familiar with it. And it's that f format, table, uh, outputs, activities, indicators, that is something that's very, very prevalent in particular in developing country governments. And why? Well, a lot of this influence came from donor uh, uh, 
development donors who, ins who, who adopted this method, which in turn was picked up from USAID, which in turn picked it up from NASA and the US military. Um, and that was, became a very important influence, in particular in developing countries, because donors played such a large role and they very often wanted to see reports in this format. Um, as you'll see when we look at some examples, that kind of format is less common in rich countries uh, than in developing countries. Now, uh, the 1990s um, saw a shift to, towards um, more standardized reporting on, on human capital, on education, um, one had, for instance, the UNDP's Human Development Indicator, um, whose definitions changed fairly substantially a few years back. If we first look at how indicators have been selected, um, <coughs> right, any, any ideas? <laughs> 